Well, hey everybody, this is Robert and welcome to Outbreak News TV. And I wanna go ahead and do a short um, news update on some of the things that are going on concerning the coronavirus disease 2019. And I always like to start out with the global map and see where things are now. And we see that it is spreading into a lot of countries. It's somewhere in the ballpark of 70 countries right now. And as you can see, the uh, of the 88,000 plus cases so far, about 80,000 in mainland China, but South Korea is reporting hundreds of cases a day. Italy is now, you know, uh, at, at about 1,700. Iran's going to push 1,000 uh, probably within hours. And we see that places in Europe other than Italy are seeing a little spike in cases too, right? We see France and Germany both reporting quite a few, over 100. Spain is getting close to 100. And uh, even like even Switzerland has 27. And we have some new countries on the map that have been uh, reported recent infections. The Dominican Republic was the first uh, case out of the Caribbean. And that was from an Italian visitor. Uh, we saw one in Ireland today and uh, additional one in Egypt. And so there's several in Egypt now. Uh, I mean, there's two in Egypt, several in Africa. There's one in Nigeria. I believe there's one in Algeria. Um, we are seeing uh, cases now in South America, a couple in Brazil, and there's at least one in Ecuador. So basically the only continent that has, is free, of course, is Antarctica. Um, so we'll be keeping a close eye on this as it continues to expand uh, with travel and the, the hot spots, right? We have, we do, we defin definitively do have hot spots right now. South Korea, Italy, and Iran are the big hot spots right now, and other countries could join them if we're not careful. If we take a look at the deaths, it's pushing three thousand, and we have seen some deaths reported, first-time deaths in certain countries. We saw one in the U.S. this weekend in Seattle, Washington. Uh, there's a death in Taiwan, or excuse me, Thailand. And I saw one in Australia. And the countries outside of China that have reported the most deaths are Iran and Italy. And South Korea is close behind. So, yeah, the outbreak keeps on uh, moving. And let's go ahead and take a look at some other news uh, concerning the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, I think it was sometime last week I reported on this lady from Osaka, Japan, who had got coronavirus earlier in the year, was treated, tested positive, was treated, tested negative, and uh, presented with symptoms again toward the end of February, and again, tested positive. Was she reinfected? Not really clear, but here's a, a Reuters report that talks about um, this virus reappearing in patients that have been already discharged, treated and discharged. A growing number of discharged coronavirus patients in China and elsewhere are testing positive after recovering, sometimes weeks after being allowed to leave the hospital, which could make the epidemic harder to eradicate. On Wednesday, the Osaka prefectural government in Japan said a woman working as a tour bus guide had tested positive for the coronavirus for a second time. And this follows reports in China that discharged patients throughout the country were testing positive after their release from the hospital. Uh, an official at China's National Health Commission said on Friday that such patients have not been found to be infectious. Experts say that there are several ways discharged patients could fall ill with the virus again. Convalescing patients might not build up enough antibody to develop immunity to SARS coronavirus 2 and are being infected again. The virus also could be biphasic, meaning it lies dormant before creating new symptoms. But some of the first cases of a reinfection in China have been attributed to testing discrepancies, according to this report. Um, Uh, Paul Hunter, a professor of medicine at Britain's University in East Anglia, who has been closely following the outbreak, told Reuters that he 
that although the patient Osaka could have relapsed, it is also possible that the virus was still being released into her system from the initial infection, and she wasn't tested properly before she was discharged. Right, and it gives a little history on her, um, on why she could be a biphasic uh, case. Um, a journal in the American Medical Association study of four infected medical personnel treated in Wuhan, the epicenter of the epidemic, said it was likely that some of the recovered patients would remain carriers even after meeting discharge criteria. Uh, Alan Chang, professor of infectious diseases epidemiology at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, said it wasn't clear whether the patients were reinfected or, or had remained persistently positive after their symptoms disappeared. But he said the details of the Japan case suggested the patient had been reinfected. So, anyway, so clearly if, if there is little immunity that goes along with this, you, you, we are going to see some reinfections, particularly in uh, areas where there's such a large amount of circulating coronavirus, um, as in Wuhan, China. So we'll be keeping a closer eye on that as time goes on. And I saw this report out of The Guardian, and it was kind of neat. They did ask a, a, a several questions, and some of them I think are important to talk about here on the show. And um, it, it said, well, most doctors had been expecting the next major viral outbreak to involve a strain of flu. In what ways does COVID-19 differ from the influenza virus? It says that both COVID-19 and influenza are respiratory illnesses and are spread by exhaled droplets, which can survive in the air and on surfaces for short times. However, the strain of the coronavirus produces a fever and a dry cough, but does not trigger runny noses or sneezing as commonly as seen in the flu. Um, and this is a, a topic we're going to be talking about later in the show. So what is the best protection against picking up the virus? In particular, how useful are face masks? Doctors say there is little evidence that masks protect wearers from infection. Instead, they recommend that people wash their hands on a regular basis, clean work surfaces and door handles, and try to avoid touching their eyes, nose, and mouth, much like any other type of respiratory infection, like flu, like the cold. Um, here's a good question they ask. Will it be possible to eradicate COVID-19, or could it reappear on a regular basis in the future? And the answer is the World Health Organization and the Chinese government both say it will be possible to eradic eradicate the virus. However, not every scientist agrees. However, I would quote, I would not be surprised if we ha now have a virus that we will have to deal with forever, says Professor Mark Woolhouse of Edinburgh University in England. However, in such cases, the first major outbreak is always the worst one. After that, it should settle down and become part of the regular repertoire of winter viruses, I would imagine, close quote. Here's a good question. Is it possible the warmer weather may bring relief? And this is, this kind of goes back to what U.S. President Donald Trump said that, you know, come April, it, the, the weather change is going to take care of it. Is that true? Well, some observers have pointed to the fact that Africa has relatively few cases of COVID-19 and that this may be a response to hotter conditions there. The virus cannot take the heat, in other words. Most scientists counsel caution, however, quote, the disease has only just arrived in Africa and it is far too early to tell how it will behave there, says Woolhouse. We'll just have to wait and see. And that is true. Um, Egypt saw a case a week or so ago, and then we just recently saw one in Nigeria and Algeria. So it is new in Africa right now. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that because um, this virus could spread very rapidly through that continent. Uh, here's a good question. What are your chances of surviving if you become infected? 
Well, it says most figures suggest around 1% to 2% of people will die after being infected with COVID-19. And we're going to talk about this later in the show too. Uh, Though that figure could decline as more and more cases in a region are recognized. Scientists are also clear about those who are most at risk for COVID-19 at the moment. It appears to be the elderly are most at risk. And again, and that's another topic we'll be looking at in a little bit. So, okay, those are just some interesting questions and with answers I just thought I would uh, share with you. And let me go ahead and take a look at this report from the New York Post. And of course, in the United States, we've been seeing uh, a small influx of uh, community sp- spread in certain parts of the country, particularly on the West Coast. And in Washington State, in the Seattle area, there's been a cluster or mini outbreak going on up there. And that's actually where the first death in the U.S. was. And the title of this piece is, Coronavirus May Have Been Spreading in Washington State for Weeks, According to Experts. Washington State's coronavirus outbreak that claimed a life over the weekend suggests that the bug had been spreading there for nearly six weeks, according to experts. Trevor Bedford, an associate professor at the University of Washington, said that one of the state's recent cases appears to be linked to Snohomish County man who was identified on January 19th as the country's first coronavirus patient. Bedford and and a research team found similarities while comparing the genetic sequence of the two samples. They indicated that the recent case had been descended from the other, suggesting that there has been community spread throughout the region. I believe we're facing an already substantial outbreak in Washington state that has not been detected until now due to narrow case definition requiring direct travel to China. His findings come after officials confirmed a patient who died in a Seattle area hospital as the first death. And there's also some additional cases um, linked to a long-term care facility uh, and several uh, healthcare workers are being, and as a matter of fact, I just saw a report that uh, two healthcare workers came up presumptively positive up there. So that's very, very new. so yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, I haven't seen anybody come out to rebut that right now, but uh, that's what's out there. And I just wanted to share that with you also. Okay, then they have this study out of China. It, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, just published on Friday, the clinical characteristics of coronavirus disease 2019 in China. And um, They extracted data regarding 1,099 patients with laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 from 552 hospitals in 30 provinces throughout China. The primary composite endpoint was admission to an ICU, the use of a mechanical ventilation or death. And I'm going to slide down here to the discussion to see what they came up with. Okay, here we go. During the initial phase of COVID-19 outbreak, the diagnosis of the disease was complicated by a diversity in symptoms and imaging findings and in the severity of disease at the time of presentation. Fever was identified in 44% of the patients on presentation, but developed in about 89% after hospitalization. Severe illness occurred in about 16% of the patients after admission to a hospital. No radiologic abnormalities were noted on initial presentation in about 3% of patients with severe disease and in 18% of those with non-severe disease. Despite the number of deaths associated with COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2 appears to have a lower case fatality rate than either SARS coronavirus or MERS coronavirus. Uh, Approximately 2% of the patients had a history of direct contact with wildlife whereas more than three quarters were either residents of Wuhan, had visited the city, or had contact with city residents. Uh, These findings echo the latest reports, including a outbreak of a family cluster, transmission from an asymptomatic patient, and the three-phase outbreak patterns. Our study cannot preclude the presence of patients who have been termed super spreaders. 
Conventional routes of transmission of SARS, MERS, and highly pathogenic influenza consist of respiratory droplets and direct contact. Uh, mechanisms that probably occur with SARS coronavirus 2 as well. Because SARS coronavirus 2 can be detected in the gastrointestinal tract, in saliva, and in urine, these routes of potential transmission need to be investigated. Um, let's see. It says, uh, despite the phylogenetic homogeneity between SARS coronavirus 2 and SARS coronavirus, there are some clinical characteristics that differentiate uh, COVID-19 from SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, and seasonal influenza. And they, they list those uh, in, on another table that I can't get at right at this point. And they talk about um, COVID-19 has spread rapidly since it was first identified in Wuhan, has been shown to have a wide spectrum of severity. Some patients with COVID-19 do not have fever, or radiologic abnormalities on initial presentation, which has complicated the diagnosis. And then there's another issue that's going on, and that's concerning the age of the patients infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And in this study, this is an analysis of the study, and he entitles it Remarkable Age Distribution of OC43, which is um, a coronavirus that is commonly seen on a seasonal basis versus SARS coronavirus 2 in China. In their preliminary analysis of the clinical parameters of COVID-19 from the first 425 patients, Lee et al. noted that there were no pediatric cases and that the median age was 59 years old. While there are sure to be pediatric cases now that the total number of confirmed cases has topped 70,000, more than about 80,000 now, uh, the impression has been that the pediatric age group has been very much spared a major impact from SARS coronavirus 2. Lee et al. surmised that perhaps the pediatric age group had some inherent resistance to SARS coronavirus 2 infection via the nonspecific immune response. While there is a precedent for such clinical resistance in other viral infections like hepatitis A and EBV, Another explanation may lie in the annual exposure of this age group to other coronaviruses causing the upper respiratory infection. In 2018, Zhang et al. published a five-year survey of upper respiratory disease in Guangzhou to the south of Hubei province in Guangdong province, focusing on the principal upper respiratory coronavirus, OC43. Not only was OC43 circulating in four of the five-year-olds, but also throughout the year. Other coronaviruses were less prominent, but there was an outbreak of upper respiratory coronavirus infection every year, likely continuing to this day. Furthermore, the age distribution of those viruses was markedly skewed to the very young pediatric age group. Thus, infants in China are exposed to OC43 and other respiratory, upper respiratory coronaviruses every year of their early life. It is likely that their surface immunity to these viral agents is regularly boosted. OC43 and SARS coronavirus 2, while their sequences can be readily aligned, have little similarity in the spike S1 protein. However, they have several areas of high sequence similarity in S2. The fusion glycoprotein moiety, uh, one hypothesis for the market age distribution of SARS coronavirus 2 could be that the younger infant and pediatric age group is resistant to SARS coronavirus 2 due to annual exposure to other coronaviruses sharing much S2 sequence, imparting secretory immunity that is not readily reinforced in the much older age groups. If true, such a finding would have powerful consequences for understanding the SARS coronavirus 2 outbreak and how to suppress it. One corollary may be that the primary and secondary schools, so often drivers of outbreaks of respiratory viruses, are not a significant factor here. I would note that two months into the outbreak, the city of 11 million and the province of 57 million, there are only 70,000 confirmed cases 
in quote, only in quotes, a number concomitant with the adult to adult transmission. A second corollary could be that the immunity to more highly conserved S2 using OC43 or HKU1 as sources of immunogen may afford a jumpstart on immunization of those who have not yet experienced the presence of SARS coronavirus 2 in their communities. Uh, sorry, it got a little bit technical there, but I thought it was necessary to uh, bring these things out. But uh, th this gentleman, Bill Gallagher, I think the website is virological.com. I might be wrong, but I think that's what it is. And um, his analysis of the study and it, you know, trying to explain why we really haven't seen a lot of pediatric cases um, of COVID-19. Now, back in the United States, we've had this issue concerning testing, and there really hasn't been a great deal of testing. Remember, the uh, CDC's uh, definition for PUIs initially was, you know, traveling to China or chi traveling to Wuhan or direct contact with somebody who came back from there. It was very, very narrow. Well, that's that has grown, and uh, there's going to be a lot more testing, I believe. But one of the problems was, is the CDC did send tests. All the, all the tests were being done at the CDC, essentially up to, you know, just a short time ago. Um, and now they sent out a test kit and there was problems with one of the primers and things had to be redone, reformulated, remanufactured, and they've sent out new test kits. So public health labs throughout the country will be testing this um, probably this week. So, and with a new PUI definition, you're, we're going to see a lot more um, test ordered. Now the state public health labs, even if they do get a positive, it'll be considered presumptive positive, and they're still going to have to be sent to the CDC for confirmation. Anyway, the CDC announced that it would allow hundreds of labs to test for the virus, while the Trump administration said it was distributing tens of thousands of testing kits. And, that, and that's important. That's going to go to the hundreds of labs because uh, the state public health labs are going to get swamped. And the private labs, whether it be you know commercial or hospital labs, they're itching to start this test too. So the FDA, of course, did put out a notification over the weekend saying, yeah, they're going to allow this. Okay, after weeks of stalled testing for the coronavirus, the United States now has enough diagnostic kits to test 75,000 people with more on the way, according to Alex Azar. He's the HHS secretary. The Trump administration has faced widespread criticism for slow and scattered delivery of testing materials to states where only 12 labs are capable of diagnosing the virus. Uh, Mr. Azar's announcement on TV today um, said that they're giving laboratories and hospitals across the country to go ahead and to conduct tests that had been severely limited to those analyzed by the CDC. That decision should improve the pace of detecting coronavirus infections and make it possible to more rapidly spot patterns of suspected or confirmed cases. That could be most Im immediately valuable on the West Coast, where several new cases of unknown origin were reported in recent days. Quote, we're not going to find what we're not looking for, so lifting the restrictions on diagnostic testing will put a lot of minds at ease, said Haley Holmer, an epidemiologist in Oregon. Uh, Mr. Azar said Sunday that the diagnostic kits, which will be distributed within two weeks, represented a radical expansion even beyond that of the testing that's available. Uh, federal health agencies, he said, were working with commercial providers to distribute an additional 50,000 kits soon. Um, dozens of labs run by states, universities, and private companies have applied for emergency approval for tests. Um, once they have submitted evidence that those tests work, they will be able to use them immediately, even before the FDA completes the review. Stephen Han, with, he's with the uh, FDA, said, this action today reflects our public health commitment to addressing critical public health needs and rapidly responding and adapting to this dynamic and evolving situation. 
and this goes back to what I said earlier. Until recently, the CDC had insisted that only its tests could be used on suspected cases and only under limited circumstances. People that traveled to China uh, or had symptoms, you know, or had contact with somebody with a known coronavirus. Um, in early February, the agency said it shipped out about 200 test kits capable of producing results on seven to 800 samples to the state labs and uh, hoped to ship more kits to other countries. But in mid-February, the agency announced that the tests were flawed and should not be used. And so the state labs continued to send samples all to the CDC. And of course, with all these samples coming from all, all the states, uh, that really does delay uh, the results getting put out. Anyway, so, oh, the kits had three components, but some of the components were producing an inconclusive result for many public health labs using the test. So th on Thursday, uh, February 27th, the agency announced that the labs with two of the three working components could go ahead and use the CDC test. And it broadened the criteria for testing to include people who had traveled to countries with coronavirus infections in addition to China. So I imagine that means countries that are having outbreaks like Italy, like Iran, and like South Korea, and, and maybe others. Okay, and let me go ahead and, and go on to the next quick topic. And we were talking about masks earlier, and seriously, people stop buying masks. And this, is, this came on Twitter from the Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Jerome Adams, and he tweeted, um, because of the, we're ha we, ha we are having a shortage of a uh, stockpile of masks. And these things should be earmarked priority for healthcare workers who are in close contact with these patients. And Jerome Adams tweeted, seriously, people, stop buying masks. They are not effective in preventing general public from catching coronavirus. But if healthcare providers can't get them to care for sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. So, and the report goes on to say, the CDC does not recommend that people who are well wear a face mask to protect themselves from respiratory diseases, including COVID-19. Face masks should be used by people who show symptoms of COVID-19 to help prevent the spread of disease to others. And let me go ahead and close out with, you know, we've talked about the impact on business in some way, and, and this impact on business has been a little on the strange side, but you might have heard the story. And this is a press release from Anheuser, Anheuser-Busch, the, the beer manufacturer. And if you remember correctly, I don't know, but maybe a month ago, three weeks ago, it, Google, it was basically reported that Google Trends was saying that Corona beer beer virus were two of the biggest things people were searching for on Google as people were taking the coronavirus and equating it to Corona beer. Well, apparently that has affected uh, business with Anheuser-Busch. And the, in this press release on their finances, uh, they have a paragraph concerning the impact of COVID-19. And it says the impact of COVID-19 virus outbreak on our business continues to evolve. The outbreak has led to a significant decline in demand in China, in both on-premise and in-home channels. Additionally, demand during the Chinese New Year was lower than in previous years, as it coincided with the beginning of the outbreak. For the first two months of 2020, we estimate that the outbreak has resulted in a loss of revenue of approximately 285 million US dollars. So there's no connection between the beer <laughs> and the virus, just in case you weren't sure. But anyway, that's just um, a small sampling of some of the news out there, a few couple studies. There's a lot of stuff out there to, to put into a video and just the video would be just be way too long. So anyway, I appreciate you watching. Share this with your friends I, to get the word out that this channel exists, share it with your friends, um, subscribe to the channel, like the video, and comment below if you have something to say. If you have something good or bad, negative or positive, I, I, I'm thick skinned, I can handle it. And I appreciate you watching. I'll see you next time on Outbreak News TV.